Okay, hello, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Network webinar series. And today we are joined by Chris Butterworth, um, who will be speaking on the topic of enterprise alignment and results, which is based on the Shingo model book. Um, just a few words about us for those who aren't familiar. We are a network um, founded by Professor Peter Hines. Um, and the network includes quarterly benchmarking events, um, which at the moment we're doing online um, with award-winning host sites um, and are led by Peter Hines. But if you would like to find out more, then you will receive my email in the follow-up email. Um, so today we'll have a 30 minute present presentation by Chris, followed by a 30 minute Q&A um, at the end where feel free to ask, ask any questions for Chris. Okay, so I'll just hand over to Peter, thank you. Uh, thanks, Emma, and uh, welcome to everyone along, and uh, uh, glad you can join us. Um, so um, Chris has actually run uh, one of our webinars before, so he's actually on for the second time. And uh, today he's going to be talking uh, about uh, Shingo material and, and one of the books he wrote for the Shingo uh, uh, Institute, uh, which was around... Um, the dimensions of, of looking at alignment and results in the organization. So uh, Chris and I have known each other for, I think probably about 25 years actually, something like that, when uh, he made the mistake of, uh, well, agreeing to a research project when he was in industry and I was at Cardiff University. So we, uh, we did a three year program and uh, I guess we've done various things since that time. So, so Chris and I have been involved with uh, the Shingo Institute probably for the last 10 or 12 years, something like that. And um, we're both, um, I'm not sure the term, fellows or something of the, the Institute, I where we basically, um, basically do work with them, uh, support the Institute. And what, in one of those activities, Chris uh, wrote this uh, book recently. So, uh, so welcome along, Chris, and uh, good to uh, see you, and um, good to hear more about, um, about the book and so forth. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Alan. So that's that's the book, uh, Enterprise Alignments and Results. So it's ed edited by, by myself, it contains a lot of uh, Shingo Institute material, and uh, this can be used to accompany the Enterprise Alignment and Results um, workshop, or it can stand alone for those who, who can't make it to the workshop. So it's it as on Amazon and. Uh, and also find it on the Shingo website. So just a little bit of uh, background for the Shingo model before I go into, into the book. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar, so I'm not going to spend too long on this, but just in terms of context, at the heart of the Shingo model is the culture and behavior in an organization. And um, that doesn't just happen. Systems drive behavior, tools, support systems, and all of them. those are informed by guiding principles. So in order for us to get results, so every organization is changing, chasing results of one thing or another, but instead of focusing on the results, our view is that uh, we need to focus on the cultures and behavior that give us those results. And there's a quote here from Edgar Shannon, the only thing of real importance that leaders do is create and manage culture. If you do not manage culture, it manages you. And we often see that, you know, we often see organizations with multiple cultures because if it's not managed, the culture yet depends on the strongest individual in an area. So the three insights that uh, from Shingo are that ideal results require ideal behaviors and Ideal results are defined as sustainable long-term results that create value for the customers and value for the shareholders and value for the employees. And insight number two is that purpose and systems drive behavior. And insight number three is that principles inform ideal behaviors. So, Let's have a look at those principles. I'm not going to go through all of these. There are three dimensions to the single principles. I'm just going to talk about these three at the top on the enterprise alignment. So I'm, I'm um, really going to give a half hour summary of a two day workshop. So I don't, uh, there's a limit to the level of detail, but, but it should give you, my intention is to give you a good taste of each of those principles. So let's have a look at create value for the customer. 
these slides are going to be available afterwards. Um, Emma will, will make them available. And um, when you think about the customer, great value for the customer. A good way to think about this is to ask people a couple of questions. So, you know, do, who do you see as your customer? And for some people, that's really an obvious statement. You know, I'm, if I'm dealing with uh, external customers on a day-to-day -day basis, then it's front of mind. If I'm in a back office, it's less clear. And um, often we see lots of support staff actually struggling. Who, who is my customer then? So it's really thought good, thought-provoking start point is who do you see as your customer? Once you this can identify them, how do you know what they really value? Do you just assume that you know that they, what they value? Do you ever ask them? Do you talk to them? So key for creating value for the customer is not to assume that you know what it is that the customer values. The other lens to think about this is value should be looking ahead. What do they really potentially value from you? as opposed to satisfaction, which is how do they rate what you do today? And not the same things. So uh, an example of the ideal behavior, one, one example could be what customer's value drives decision-making and improvement opportunities. So when we, making decisions, setting priorities, deciding on what improvements to work on, have we got that lens of the customer on? Are we looking at all those things through what the eyes of the customer? Um, I should have spelled this out. Uh, KBI is a key behavioral indicator. So what we see in many organizations is if they just chase results, we get um, chasing key performance indicators. They are, tend to be like measures. Key behavioral indicators are lead measures. What are some of the things that we can measure that help to drive the behavior we're looking for? So for, for example, one that I saw working really well here is an internal customer attendance at a team huddle. So this was a, a finance team. And uh, once a week, they would invite a, a customer representative to the huddle. And at the end of the meeting, they would simply say, ask the customer, did we talk about the things that are important to you in our huddle? And the answer was yes, they gave themselves a green tick. And if it was no, they gave themselves a red cross. And I'm, either way, the second question was why? What was it that we didn't talk about? Or what is it that you find most valuable that we did talk about? So this is, this is a really good way of getting people to think outside of their own team. Even if I don't see the external customer directly, who, who are the people that I'm serving that serve the customer? Now, I mentioned that um, systems drive behavior. So some of the systems that influence this principle would be a voice of the customer system, would be a value stream management system. Um, so, you know, lots, of, lots of other systems. One of the key things about the voice of the customer is that we need to talk to customers. We can't just send them surveys and assume that we'll get a good response. Usually we get a very biased response from people who are exceedingly happy or are not very happy. So um, conversations are necessary to really understand the voice of the customer. You can do some things that, like Net Promoter Score too, that's a useful tool uh, to give you an indicator. But again, it's probably more focused on satisfaction with what we're doing today rather than really deeply getting into what customers value. So there is a, there is a paper on the Shingle website that I wrote on, on, on voice of the customer and stuff, which is free to download if you want further input on that. Um, some tools um, could be value stream maps, could be customer interviews, could be waste walks. Now, one thing I found quite fun sometimes when teaching people waste walks is to say, oh, well, imagine that 
the customer is sitting on your shoulder as you're walking around and ask them anything you see that doesn't look quite right ask them would they be happy to pay for it and if the answer is no and then you say well why are we doing it then why, why are we doing things that the customer wouldn't pay for or that the customer wouldn't be happy with it's just sort of one of the lenses to look through so what in summary i think if we think about to uh, create value for the customer think about customer in the widest sense of the customer not just the external customer um, think about the broad don't get hung up on whether someone's a customer or a stakeholder or you know whatever label we put it to think about it in terms of who do we provide a service to who does our team provide its services to and if there's multiple of them and who do we provide most of our services to try and get it into some focus that way and make them try and get to a value statement from with that customer what is it they most value from your team and the last point on this one is you know, think about it if we if we're going to change something make an improvement what we should be aiming to do in any change or improvement is to make the experience better for the customer and simpler for our people to make sure we do both we want to make it harder for the customer we want to make the experience worse for the customer we don't want to make the cost try and make the experience better but then make it harder for our people there's chances that that won't work so always challenge yourself to do both improve the customer experience and make it simpler for our people to provide that experience okay let's move on a slide so what does good look like um well every person knows who their customers are we know what they really value because we've discussed it with them and we focus continuous improvement activities on improving that value every day. And so we're constantly reviewing that. And we're also making sure we have mechanisms in place to check when that value might change. Because it won't, it won't stay the same. I got the slides a bit stuck. Okay, constancy of purpose. So like a quote here around which like from a um, Victorian prime minister is that the secret of success is constancy of purpose. So what do we mean by, by creative constancy of purpose? What we, what we should be able to see is that line of sight so that we, we know where we're heading and everyone in the organization knows where we're heading and knows what they need to do to help to contribute to. So I found some, some good questions to test whether this principle is in place or not, is um, to ask people, how, how do you relate personally to the organization's purpose? And I don't, we don't want people here just to be able to recite the fixed words, you know, the parrot fashion, because that's just something they do from the head and they, they've wrote, learned it by rote. What we want to have done is get into their hearts and get them to think about it. So that's why I relate personally. What is it? you do that you can see contributes to the purpose and you know a, good, a really good question to help people think thinking in that way so can you give me an example of how you contributed to the purpose in the last week to make it really time specific there are um some organizations i know where they'll actually build that question in as a standard to their huddles so people that will ask people and then we'll have a purpose statement on top of the huddle board uh, and we'll say to people can you give me an example from this week where we've contributed to the consciousness of purpose and um what that does is help bring it to life for everybody remind them about how they're connected so an example of the behavior could be People demonstrate in their conversations and actions that they are fully aligned with the purpose. Well, how, how, how might we see that? Well, we could see them um, by the way that the conversations they have. When they're making decisions, when they're setting priorities, are they saying, is that the best outcome for the customer? There's lots of um, ways that people demonstrate. 
an, a kind of example of a key behavioral indicator is you know, we could do quick quick surveys and it doesn't have to be a formal survey where we email people we could just ask uh, a number of people on when we're doing our walks and say well how how many of those people i spoke to felt that the work directly supported the organization's purpose it's not necessarily a, a scientific analysis doing it that way but it gives leaders a good feel for how people are connecting do we know what the purpose is? Do they know how they help to contribute to? And so some systems, um, strategy deployment system, you know, could be a Hoshin Canary system, could be an X matrix system, lots of different ways of doing it. Um, could be the yellow board system, which we which uh, feature myself are familiar with. Uh, could be uh, uh, you know the prioritization system could be very important, and the communication system is also going to be important. Now the key thing about systems is that if we go and talk to people and we only got a low percentage of uh, people that feel that their work directly supports the organization's purpose, that's not their fault. What that's telling us is that there is an issue with one or more of our systems and that the way we're deploying the purpose is not working. It's probably, it may be that people can tell us what it is, but they don't see how they connect. So what we've done there is communicated it, but not deployed it. So that's the key thing here is when we're looking at systems, the reason we're looking at them is what might we need to change in that system to help drive the behavior that we're looking for. And if we're not getting the behavior, which systems do I need to review and change to help me get it. And some tools that, that might uh, be applied and to, to help constitute purpose would be a visual management board, very powerful huddles, look, listen, and learn walks. Uh, again, there's a paper that I wrote on, on the shingle website on that one. Um, I think it's more descriptive than just calling it Gemba walks because people, you know, it can be, oh yeah, we do that. Well, do you go and look? Do you listen to what people say and what have you learned on the walk? I think it's a, a more powerful way to uh, help us to understand what makes a good walk. Okay, what does good look like? Well, every person knows how they contribute to the purpose. They use the purpose to make decisions and set priorities and they ensure that all activities are aligned to the purpose. Now, you might think, well, that's a bit similar to the points I made about what was good for creating value for the customer. And they are, because there should be a very strong link between the purpose and the customer. Some organizations, it's, it's, it's crystal clear, well, there's less so. But um, you know, we should be able, to, people sh should be simple enough that people can understand this is the purpose. And that relates directly to what customers know. Okay, I think there's a quick survey here. So I think Emma is um, going to launch that. Are you there, Emma? Hi, Emma. No. I'm not sure Emma seems to be here, Chris. I, I just keep going, perhaps. All right, no problem. Um, don't do this now. So, um, but think about it. Yeah. Question to ask yourselves. Uh, how many people in your organization really connect what they do on a day basis with the organization's purpose and the customer? It's a good way of checking whether how alive these principles are. And think systemically. Now, this is um, it's often mistyped as think systematically. Um, systemically is is specific because it means we're looking at the whole thing. And there's a very powerful quote from Deming here: a company that could put a top person in every position and still be swallowed by a competitor with people only half as good could who work together. This is about thinking about the whole enterprise. Do we think about the end-to-end -end process and 
especially from the lens of the customer. Now, customers actually don't care about departments. One of, one of the worst voice of the customer exercises I saw one organization do was to actually um, get a form from each department and go and talk to customers about what the different departments in the business did. And customers are, well, you're just one company, so I don't care what departments you've got, just give me the services I'm required. So some good questions to ask people in, uh, here and ask ourselves too is, can you give me an example of how change in use in your process might impact other teams? So am I, am I going to, if I'm going to change something, do I understand impact that has on other areas? Quite easy to improve something in my little bit, but at the detriment of somewhere else in the value stream. And you can, I'm not good with very to explore as well is how a problem solved that come from other departments and teams. So is it just a pointing fingers, blame, it's not our fault, or that's because they messed it up, or is it a collaborative approach to saying, okay, we need to do a multidisciplinary, uh, multifunctional problem solving activity to address this. We can't do it on our own, let's get together and work out what the solution is across the process. So some um, example behavior might be proactive collaboration across the boundaries. Oh, we always put in the first customer first. So one thing I often see is people get focused internally and kind of look at things just from the different departments perspective and lose track of the point that both departments are there to survey customer. And you can often overcome lots of uh, difficulties and uh, possibly even some conflicts by reminding people to both lift themselves up and think about the customer and how they collaborate to deliver what the customer needs, what not, what is important to the department. So some egg, uh, examples of uh, systems is a value stream management again. Could, uh, could be what system have we got in place for ensuring cross-functional alignment of KPIs? Now we see uh, a lot of deployment deploys by function and there is no cross review, which another, so we end up with conflicts between departments or functions because we haven't sat down and said, well, actually, if you do that, that means this for me. So how do we create something that's a shared KPI rather than that's gonna help us to collaborate rather than put KPIs out there that will cause conflict. One of the uh, systems that's very powerful to do that is the internal voice of the customer system. How do we sit down and understand what each other values? Because often departments are customers and suppliers of each other. It's just a two-way conversation. You know, uh, people and culture or HR is a good example. They, they, uh, they are a service provider to operations, for example, or other, other areas, but actually operations is also a provider to them of good quality data or uh, requirements. So it's a two-way conversation, isn't it? How can we help each other? Uh, and so, so you know, the internal voice of the customer can also be seen as a tool, depending on the, the scale of what you do. Cross-functional huddles are also very powerful. So do how many people go and visit other teams and, and uh, listening to what's important to them. And uh, the end-to-end -end value stream mapping across the whole process. So think systemically is about understanding how we get value to flow through the whole organization, not just through departments. What does good look like? One team where people understand that customers don't care about departments and instead focus on improving the flow of value through the whole organization. One paper I really like about this is uh, by Professor Doug Howard, who talks about enterprise thinking, the enterprise thinking mindset, where people no longer think about departments, but think about the whole organization, put that first, how does the department support the whole organization? So I, I, I make that about 28 minutes. Um, any questions?
Uh, thanks so much, Chris. Um, right, so if we have any questions, please could you put them in the, uh, type them into the question box and I'll uh, bring them through to, to Chris. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll uh, start off perhaps from one of my own, Chris. Um, <clears throat> when, I, when I presented the, um, the, the uh, create value for the customer, I've always had in my in my mind of a much wider definition of customer than either the external customer or even the internal customer that, that you talked about, which is obviously you know reasonable. But actually thinking about the customer could be the owner of the organization, the shareholders, for example, because you're trying to create value for them, shareholder value, etc. It could be the wider community or society um, that you're working within. And, and particularly for the employee themselves, as obviously they're a sort of customer of the organization in, in terms of, you know, they're making a living and, and so forth. So what are your thoughts about particularly the, the voice of the employee here and, and the organization listening? Because particularly if, if you think about this alignment, it, it's in, in the Shingo terms, it, it's quite sort of top down in thinking. It's, it's quite to do with the voice of the organization rather than the voice of the employee. Have you any thoughts on that? Well, I think I think uh, it's a good, very good point. The, 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 I think people often get hung up on the term customer, you know, and, think, and, and it narrows the thinking. And, uh, and uh, it's just that person who provide an external service to. And one of the reasons why I recommend that question of who do you think of as your customer is to try and open up people's thinking. So, uh, yeah, because you're, you're hoping that you'll get a whole, and it won't often do, a whole range of uh, answers from all the things you've mentioned, depending on where people are in. But, but rarely, in fairness, um, do people really think of the employee as customer. It's, it does happen. Um, but, you know, as you know, on the, on the latest paper that, that uh, we, we've just put together and the one you published previously, I, I think we're provoking people's thinking in with that to say actually how how do we think of our employees as customers and the nearest i think of is is when uh, organizations actually say well the, the role of leaders is to serve our people so that they can serve the customer and that's close but it's not quite there yet in terms of the full thinking of an employee as the customer so mm. i think um, Lots of opportunities to broaden the perspective on who we think of as the customer. Because hmm. hmm. that obviously would link through into, you know, constancy of purpose, because it could be the purpose of the employee or the goals of the employee. And uh, yeah. think systemically could be about them thinking systemically about their journey through the organization. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, we've got a question from Andy here, who says, uh, and I, I've been exactly uh, feel for you, Andy, the same thought, is what have you seen in terms of how the end customer voice is communicated through the organization to everyone? So Andy's experience is that the internal account manager or director often gives a rather biased view of the customer. Um, what are your thoughts in this area? Great point, great point. Uh, <laughs> the, the, I often joke with the people about this to say, well, I, actually, we do know what the customer value is, but it's a secret in the sales, held in the sales department. Um, and there's lots of, lots of ways to try and uh, make that more effective. So, for example, I know a few organizations that uh, when they do voice the customer interviews, it's not the account executive of that client who goes and does them. They actually have someone from operations or another area uh, because it's very hard to, to have an unbiased conversation to collect customer value if you're the sales account owner for that customer. So that's one one thing that does work really well. It's a bit of uh, work with the sales team to get them to understand the importance of doing it that way, but lots of organizations do. The other uh, thing that I think is really powerful uh, to get a better internal understanding across the organization is to use stories. So there's a couple of organizations I know where they'll actually um, take a true customer story and create it on a big notice board with a photograph of the customer, or they'll put customer stories into the weekly briefings. They'll actually 
Uh, one organization I visited had a specific program where they brought customers in once a month to talk to people in the manufacturing areas and in the office about what it was like to use their product. So you had forums where you know it was all about the customer coming and saying, well, this is what I found. And they got some amazing stuff out of that. They actually got some new products based on some of those conversations with customers mm -hmm. or ideas for new products. So I think I think um, <clears throat> do lots of things to get it at, get it out of um, the sales department can't own customer value because at the end of the day they don't really deliver it. So it's about getting the voice of the customer communicated through lots of different channels and in lots of different ways. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Chris. I think uh, I mean. As, as you say, there's lots of ways you can do this. I, mean, I was fortunate enough to be at uh, one company, a uh, company called Boston Scientific over in Clonmel in Ireland, and they, they actually had a customer day um, and they made a sort of party out of it. You know, there's a big marquee and food and drink, and et cetera. And um, obviously, if you're in the medical device or, or that type of industry, it, it can be quite um, emotional uh, to understand customer journeys when perhaps you've saved someone's life with a in their case, pacemaker or, or some sort of product like that. So they had a series of customers coming in and giving short testimonials and particularly powerful when they were sort of friends or relatives of someone that worked at, at, at the place. And, you know, they gave a whole day to it. Employees can, you know, go and listen to the customers and you can imagine the, you know, the emotion and, and, the, and the power that that, uh, that generated. Obviously, right. for some of us with our own products, they're not necessarily as passionate as saving someone's life, but uh, that one was good. The other one I was thinking of, what, what about your view of, of sending, say, you know, people lower down in the organization to go and visit people where their product or service is actually used by a customer yes. to the customer? That's a really good one. I forgot about that. Yeah, that is very powerful. Um, actually, getting people not only to go and visit them but to to, to uh, use it you know so often people might see if the manufacturer a part of a product so let's go and have a, go and do a customer experience and see if customers how they are used the, the end product that we're making um and and, and getting people to <clears throat> do to bring custom bring customers in but also get to teams of people to visit customers and even share ideas and benchmarking and talk about you can even do joint value stream mapping is also very powerful as you know there's a, uh, you can do whole supply chain value stream maps extremely powerful like the, the pineapple example from australia mm, mm, mm. so thinking about the create constancy of purpose so you know and the think systemically you, you, you've obviously given that as a sort of you know, across the organization, across departments and so forth. What about us sort of from a time point of view? Would that apply in that sort of way? So constancy of purpose, meaning you keep the purpose the same, you know, we're still going in this direction because I see some organizations every year have a new strategy and it gets very confusing for people. Mm. I think that constancy of purpose needs to be much longer than a year. You know, uh, and the strategy to achieve it might change each year. I mean, that's might be a bit too frequent to change that, but the goals and targets often change yearly. But the purpose is much longer; should be more, much more enduring. I mean, the example more to leave is a good one. We see we save lives. Well, that's going to be there forever. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, mm. People can relate to that. I would all mm. can't all say we save lives, but there's a there's a um, supermarket chain um, which has one that says make people's lives better a little bit better every day well, that's been the, the purpose for years and years so I think you've got to think about purpose in as longer term probably five to mm. ten years is a minute mm. Mm. okay uh, and if there's any more questions please type them in otherwise I'll keep asking Chris, the more difficult questions, probably. <laughs> so, um, if we if we take the think systemically, what what which organisations do you think are particularly good at that? Um, I think the organisations where the leadership teams realise the role 
is to manage the culture and manage the enterprise as a whole as opposed to report on the functional performance so because it starts with that so if you think uh you know the types of if some leaders senior leadership team meetings that i observe and um, the leaders will simply get around a table once a fortnight once a month and they will report on the performance of their functions and all they're doing there is is reinforcing the silo thinking and the breakthrough comes when they realize that actually uh, we don't come together as a team to report on our functions we come together as a team to manage the enterprise so what are the things that we need to talk about what are the often key behavior indicators that we need to work on together as a team and we're still managing our functions but that's a separate conversation mm -hmm. so what starts happening then is you hear a lot more conversations about we rather than i about us rather than them so it's that it, and it needs a change in conversation a change in mindset where people focus on how do we get value to the customer through the whole organization not and not create barriers by measuring uh things that create conflict between departments so it's that it's, it's that those organizations that have changed their thinking as opposed to some organizations deliberately set conflict between departments mm -hmm. or, or I don't like... it unintentionally I remember years ago reading a book by uh, guys called Rumbler and Braish, and it was called Managing the White Spaces. Uh, it was from the mm. 1980s, and it was sort of looking at a matrix organization. And obviously, the you know you got a line coming down, a line going across for the different you know the functional, and then the sort of processes. And what they said the secret to the organization was managing the white spaces or the bits between the lines. That was actually the key which was actually quite a nice way of thinking of this sort of systemic thinking. It's not, it's not the lines, it's, it's, the, it's the gaps that are the, the real issue. So, sort of thing, so. That's a really good point. The, the, other, the organizations that, that uh, some organizers that do this really well are the ones that have been able to organize by value stream. Yeah. So, so you can't always do that, but where you can, that, that, that's very powerful. Um, where you can't change the organization, uh, or it doesn't lend itself to a value stream structure, then uh, you can actually just make sure that you're measuring the right KPIs and KBIs to drive that enterprise thinking. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, there's another question here from Andy. Uh, to what extent does passion have in driving this enterprise system thinking? That's a um, really good question. Um, I think you have to have a passion to to vote to drive any improvement activity and in many organizations getting enterprise thinking in will will require lots of different activities uh, helping people to think differently changing the kpis people use introducing behavioral standards that drive enterprise thinking so i think it needs a passion it needs a lot of listening and um it probably needs a bit of compassion too to think about it, it make sure that we're thinking about the impact of our actions on other people mm. 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 okay good I, I'm, I'm thinking more about this constancy of purpose that, that we've been talking about and, and you gave some examples where it's not just you know having the words and the powerpoint slides or something it's it's actually creating meaning for the individuals, uh, I was thinking how, how much you do that because I mean I've been in so many organisations and particularly as you get below the sort of middle management level, you know you you hear all this you know make more money, improve productivity, improve quality, and you can just sort of see the you know people at the lower levels are quite often sort of rolling their eyes, going here we go again, lots of stuff that doesn't <clears> really mean anything to me, and I, you know I can't really buy into any of this stuff. How how do, how do you get that message down to you know, someone, I don't know, driving a forklift truck or, uh, well, actually think of the example from the UK, a, a truck driver, when we got such a shortage of truck drivers at the moment, you know, and, and how, how do you actually get that constant, how do you get them engaged in that? So we have to have different conversations. 
And um, I think uh, I like before I remember visiting a company in Germany and uh, the forklift truck driver in the warehouse had, um, was moving material around and creating space. And I was walking through with the chief executive. And, um, he stopped. Oh, this is interesting. That's, I just want to ask Klaus what he's doing. So we walked over and, and uh, so what are you, do, what are you doing, Klaus? So well, I've uh, heard the team meeting the other week, uh, last week. I, I, I heard we've got a new product line coming in, and that's going to need uh, more space. So I decided to that if I can reorganise this area, I can create that space for the extra stock that's going to come in. And no one had asked him to do that. But he, 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 what he was in the mindset of was he knew that they were going to grow, they had to grow the business. One of the things that were growing on, growing in was uh, going to impact him in terms of space he needed. So he just went and took an action that directed. So he was able to interpret that. Now, that doesn't just happen. You have got to make sure people are asking, I think, asking good questions and listening, showing that you're really listening to people. Because it was one of the most powerful things you can do. Mm -hmm. The the um, you want people. If we just tell people, then they'll hear ten percent of what we what we're saying. If we ask people, then they have to think about an answer. So instead of communicating downwards and telling, then when we go in, look, learn, and listen, we should be asking questions that help people to think about how they contribute. We can't not, not just tell them. There was a, uh, one of the supermarkets I was working with, they, um, I asked a, a checkout operator uh, who was uh, 19 years old and had been there for about a year. And, um, and I just said, uh, do you, do you, are you aware of the of the purpose of the organisation? Oh yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. Um, can you can you give me an example of, of any of anything that you've done recently that you you see contributes to that purpose? Which was purpose was making people's lives better, a little bit better every day. So she thought about it for a minute and then she said, um, "Well, last week, one of uh, my regular people who comes in." With her three children, got all the shopping on the um, through the checkout. I rung it all in, and she only have as cash, and uh, she was two dollars short, and uh, was having to put something back um, from the shopping so that she could afford it. So I just gave her two dollars. And uh, I think that was a good way to uh, make her life a bit better. Uh, wow, you know, can I can I replicate you and clone you around the organisation? But that was that was um, she got it, you know. She she and one of the ways that she got that was that at every huddle meeting, they asked people to talk about it and say, okay, can anyone think of the examples they got from this week where they've helped make people's lives a little bit better. So what you're doing is you're, you're in, encouraging people to think about it in a different way. You're not telling them, get our cost now and do this, you're getting them to think about it. And actually lots of the ideas they came up with did reduce cost dramatically, but they were able to connect that to making people's lives better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to have a question for Andy here, um, and I'm not sure whether you're going to know the answer to this one. So he, he said, um, well, two parts. So what are your thoughts on the Bovis cycle model? But you might not know what the Bovis cycle Which model is. I, uh, for, no, tell me, because I, I do know that and I forgot what it is. Well, this is starting with the belief. So we, we, we had a, a session a couple of weeks ago. You start with the beliefs and then you, you, you work on and and, and work on the feeling. So it's a sort of soft systems type in, um, improving the person, if you like. Um, well, I think that increasingly we need to uh, think more about the individual, more about the person, 
in all of these, uh, in all improvement activities. And particularly on things like, when we talk about constancy of purpose and think systemically, um, that they can be very process driven. And I think a lot of improvement, and I'm reflecting on, on my lessons learned over the years, are far too much improvement is, is, is just process focused and not feelings focused, uh, not behavioral focused. So I, I, I think that it's critical to focus on people's feelings and the behaviors and make sure that the processes or systems we put in actually support the behaviors that we want. Yes, in fact, Chris, you, you sent me recently this, uh, this article about, you know, uh, mental health and sports psychologists and, and all this sort of th saying that, you know, there's been so many high profile sports people coming out with mental health concerns with it, tennis or cricket or football and all sorts of things. And, you know, five, t even five years ago, you know, we would have been telling people to, you know, get, pull their act, pull their act together. And yep. whereas now it's, it's being, you know, what people are thinking and feeling, uh, it seems to be starting to be taken a lot more seriously. Absolutely, and it needs to be, yeah. Mm. Very good. So Andy has a second bit. I'm not quite sure I understand this bit, but um, it, the second bit is, so that was, what are your thoughts on the Bovis cycle model? And do you see alignment with EST? Wasn't sure what EST was. Um, Maybe you need to type that in, Andy. He might be typing it in. <laughs> Let's see. Good, because I, I, I'm. It's, oh, it's right. Enterprise and... system thinking. Oh, of course. Right. Good one. Uh, wow. Um, so, I'm not sure I understand the question. Does enterprise. Thinking systems and the Bovis model support each other. Is that the question? I, I think maybe you've already answered it in in your first part. Is do they do they fit together? So I think the the ethos that we were hearing in the presentation was, you know, if you just do PDCA on its own, then you're working on the thinking, but you're not working on the feeling. So how can you be systemic if you're only working on half the mind? And, and that I think was the the thesis of of the presentation. Thank you. He says exactly. Questions, Andy. That was uh, that was very okay. Very, very thought provoking. Very, very very good. So um, I I don't know if there's any more questions or anything else you'd like to share with us, uh, Chris. Uh, just that if anybody, uh, there's more information on the Shingle website. And uh, the book is also available from Amazon. Good, good. Okay, and at some point in the, hopefully not too far away, Chris and I will be doing a book together for this Shingo Institute, um, which is sort of the best of the best. Unfortunately, this is being slightly held up because of COVID, because we wanted to sort of go and visit the firms to collect the case material, but uh, obviously that's not so easy at the moment. So. Um, maybe in uh, 2030, we'll finally get around to complete that book. Anyway, um, I'd like before, to thank you very much. Before that, in, o in October, we have got a new book coming out, haven't we, on, uh, on the power of assessments? Yes. So, so we, we will, will have a, a webinar on that as well, I guess. Yes, we have. We'll have a session, uh, including Kevin Eyre, who's written one of the chapters of that book, um, looking at that uh, in about a month's time. Great. Well, thanks very much, Chris, for that session. It was very, uh, very interesting, very enjoyable. And um, I'm going to hand over to Emma to close us down for the day. Thanks, Peter, and thanks very much, Chris, um, and thank you for those joining us today. Um, as Chris mentioned, if you would like the slides, just email myself um, in the email that you'll receive after um, the webinar closes, along with some um, feedback as well. And we hope to see you again soon. So thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye, Chris. Bye, bye Emma. Bye. Bye, bye. bye Peter.